Well, the sequel to Train to Busan is out in South Korea and will be coming out in English subs in August and then to the streaming platform Shudder sometime in 2021. So keep in mind, I haven't seen Peninsula yet, so further zombie info outside the trailers won't be included for future viewers. Even after discussing everything great and everything wrong with the movie, I was just so excited about a sequel that I had to do my first Why You Wouldn't Survive movie scenario about Train to Busan and its lore and zombies. This will be the first time I do a Why You Wouldn't Survive on a movie, despite a video with the similar title already being out there. But hey, I can't complain too much since I have a series called Zombie Sins after all. I was holding out on doing movies for quite a while to cover games, but hey, what better time than now? Also, you guys voted for this by a wide margin, so make sure to vote next time if you want a non-zombie related movie. This week, we are covering the I'm not crying, you're crying, feeling a bit bitey, instant rigor mortis makes you go snap, crackle, pop! South Korea can make a better zombie movie with more depth on a budget of $8.5 million versus an American movie with Brad Pitt, a whole book of literal source material to draw from and ignore, and a $190 million budget, zombies that love to mosh, infected that cling on harder than poop on a butt cheek, getting all dark and veiny in a matter of seconds, these guys aren't a fan of daylight savings time, how the hell did he grow that whelp on his face in a matter of seconds, a zombie movie with a lot of emotion, and the no, Daddy, no! movie itself. This time around, we are telling you why you wouldn't survive Train to Busan slash Peninsula slash Soul Stations Zombie Apocalypse. Originating near Seoul, the capital of South Korea, in a remote countryside where a minor leak in a chemical factory in the biotech district spreads to the local wildlife and livestock, possibly similar to the chemical leak at the Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, India in 1984, but not to as a noticeably severe initial degree where the fumes of these acids and chemicals like methyl isonate, commonly used to make pesticides and plastics, vaporized into the air over a multi-kilometer radius, invading the lungs of any living things, leaving thousands dead and hundreds of thousands with medical defects. Not only this, but contaminating the soil and water nearby as well, shown with news articles in the movie articulating the large amounts of dead fish in the Jinyong Reservoir. There was also another real-life chemical leak that had occurred by the South Korean-owned plant LG Polymers, also in India, where negligence and poor safety standards were the root cause of hundreds of sicknesses and nearly a dozen deaths. It was probably in a very similar nature that negligence and poor safety standards for this chemical plant were involved in Train to Busan's biotech district, and the fact that Sakwu sold all funding to this corporation that could have been used to prevent further contamination and possibly warning immediate areas to take precautions that would have caused further damage. With the chemical leaks of Bhopal and LG polymers that caused death by poisoning or asphyxia and long-term side effects for those that survived, the particular chemical manufactured in Train to Busan had much more horrifying effects that we see throughout three different movies. While hazmat and quarantine units brushed it off as a minor leak. <laughs> We see more to it, as the deer that gets hit by a car not too far away from the quarantine slowly and stiffly gets back up on its hooves, covered in grave-looking injuries, severe glaucoma and or cataracts, blood dripping from the mouth, and most alarming, what sounds and looks like rigor mortis as the fawn unnaturally gets back up from its dead state, with bones and joints loudly snapping with every movement. The initial means of infection are still quite unknown in the franchise, and we may or may not get additional details with the sequel movie Peninsula, but the fact that it can spread to at least deer means that it could be transmissible between mammals hinting at maybe rabies, or in a separate possibility, a chemical that leads to an advanced form of chronic wasting disease a prion-related illness that hellaciously deteriorates the brain, but currently is only prominent in mammals closely related to deer, elk, and moose, 
showing symptoms like drastic weight loss, stumbling, lack of coordination, listlessness, drooling, aggressive behavior, and lack of fear in any regard. If you want to hear more on CWD, check out this video I made on the subject last year in the links at the end of the video. But the bottom line is CWD is restricted to these animals, but maybe because of the chemical, it could leap to humans and other animals in the animal kingdom. The biodistrict chemicals may have affected this deer who had chronic wasting disease beforehand and mutated this disease to the point that the deer became a veritable patient zero, amplifying certain symptoms and exacerbating how fast they appear, but most notably spurring a virus that pretty much brings back the dead, visibly darkening the skin, causing their blood vessels to become prevalent, their eyes to become foggy and reducing their visual capacity to a very slight degree, causing the body's muscles to tighten, akin to rigor mortis for a short time, becoming strictly aggressive to any non-infected personnel like any other zombie, causing erratic stationary behavior with them flinching and being skittish when nothing is around and they're just kind of chilling, and of course, the zombie stereotype. Being bitten or scratched by an infected person can transmit the virus through direct blood or saliva into a victim's body. The transmission and turning rate varies heavily throughout Train to Busan and Soul Station, with the very first infected canonical person we see being an elderly gentleman being bitten in the neck. Elderly people tend to have weaker immune systems and less of a fighting chance against virulent infections, especially ones of this nature. However, the old man, despite having a bite directly in the neck, was able to walk around the streets of Seoul before lying down in pain for quite a while until his portly friend finds him and then goes all over town trying to find him shelter and medicine to treat him and get him better. And when the fat guy returns, he finds him visibly dead. The old man eventually does reanimate when the fat guy walks off and comes back, and then he attacks the fat guy with this occurring over the span of at least an hour or two. Yet we find the first infected woman in Train to Busan who was bitten in the leg and she has time to panic into the train's washroom to find safety. Then she eventually goes out to collapse on the ground and convulse for a while for an attendant to find her and then she eventually dies. She has a similar brief moment of death after her convulsive episode, but in the span of about 10 seconds, she is already creeping up as an aggressive infected despite being younger and bitten in a much less critical part of the body. So either the continuity works in favor of the turn time for the story to get more intense, the turn time relies on the DNA structure of the host and how heavily the body resists, or this unknown virus is completely unpredictable in its turn time and is impossible to determine how long it may take for a bitten person to turn. I mean, hell, this train attendant right here was bitten in the chair he died and turned while even developing this giant welt or a wart or some kind of growth over his right eye, all in the matter of a couple seconds flat. I mean, in most cases thereafter in the movie of Train to Busan, the infection time literally takes only a few seconds, or maybe about 30 seconds so a guy can cry over a dead girlfriend. So it may be that the more the disease is allowed to spread, the more it mutates and the stronger it gets from person to person. Although, again, we see a big old fellow in Soul Station bitten in the neck, die, and turn in the jail cell in less than a minute. So let's just, I mean, we'll just, we'll default to the DNA RNG turn time. How about that? Causing this nearly insta-zom in people really does wonders for their numbers to rise at a realistic and dangerous rate. When enough of the technical undead start creating large enough numbers in small spaces, we will begin to see their greatest strength. Being the most deadly in hordes, these particular infected swarm in a very similar fashion to the zombies of the World War Z movie adaptation, but not to a very extreme degree where they can go over giant walls, clustering up like piles of ants to break through defenses, make an effective wall of the undead in small spaces to push through tiny areas and close in on targets ferociously, even to the point where they may even fuse together? I mean, that's what we're seeing in this brief clip from the Peninsula trailer. Or to grab on to fast-moving vehicles with each individual grabbing hold of the next in a gigantic clusterfuck of other infected that may climb on top of each other to reach their prey. I mean, you have to think. 
about the amount of strength and stamina necessary to be able to keep hold of the KTX train, that is astounding considering the KTX's maximum speed is up to 205 miles or 330 kilometers per hour. Even if the train was at only even a quarter of its speed in motion, you still have to wonder how these zombies have dozens of other zombies holding onto their bodies and legs while being dragged through so much. It's genuinely surprising that these zombies mutated to have the upper body strength to basically hold the weight of what looks like nearly two to three dozen other infected shared between only these three zombies holding the line at these guardrails. The average weight of a female South Korean is about 125 pounds, while male South Koreans are somewhere near 169. If we assume those possibly 30 zombies that are holding onto the train are half male and half female, then the weight of the load these three zombies carry is about 4,410 pounds or 2,000 kilograms. That is two tons. Factoring in the carried weight of many, plus dealing with train level road rash and other zombies running on top of them, shows their tenacity and often fluctuating adrenaline levels of power to even be able to hold on to the train in this way. Although earlier in the Train to Busan movie, Sang Hua was able to keep off a horde of over six with most of his failing strength as he himself turns. And Sak Wu was able to repel a singular infected on his own for a short while. So the difference in strength may vary, but it also might depend on the situation at hand. They can maintain high enough speeds for any normal running man without wearing out and will mostly only stop giving chase if their target outruns them in a vehicle or if they are out of reach high up. These zombies can even leap great distances to close the gap and either tackle down their prey or latch onto them to sink their teeth in like a jockey. And keep in mind, this is their only objective and goal in mind, to bite and rip you apart to spread the infection. So much so that their cognitive skills are greatly lessened to that of a feral animal. Forgetting how to open doors, losing sight of survivors means they don't exist anymore as fire extinguishers, blocking off windows makes them forget survivors were ever there, and getting knowingly stuck in a seatbelt and still trying to push forward. Their greatest weakness, though, is sudden shifts from brightly or dimly lit areas into near or total darkness, where they will experience what seems to be sensory overload to the point of confusion and will be stunned. Losing track of even a very person directly in front of them, if they lose line of sight, they will go after any sources of sound they hear to manipulate to either avoid or draw into a trap. However, this does not seem to be the case if they are out in the middle of the night since it's an easier transition into darkness. Being easily able to spot and hunt down healthy people without any issues concerning their sight, but will in these times of day be more prone to sources of light and sound, as Peninsula also shoves off in their trailers with brightly lit remote controlled cars and large flares that do distract hordes of zombies. They might not be the brightest, <laughs> get it because I was talking about lights earlier, <laughs> but won't hold back trying to bite you in a rage induced flurry or band together with others to cause a ferocious and relentless threat that will stop at nothing to bite, scratch, and maim you to death or infect you, whatever comes first. At the end of the day, they are pretty much the basic form of a zombie, a mindless, feral beast of a former person, clinically dead and can only be killed by removing the head, destroying the brain, or causing significant enough damage to the body. Despite the sounds of rigor mortis and the zombie stereotype, these zombies can run without restriction at high speeds like the 28 days later infected. But kind of more towards the World War Z zombies because they are dead and will not suffer from dehydration or starvation and have no finite expiration date. As we can see, large amounts of the undead are still around four years later in the trailer for Peninsula. So there's no chance of you outlasting the dead just by natural concerns in this scenario. So to put this in our realm of reality, if it suddenly happens, 
Well, we have to think of how it could start. Things could start to break out after a possible large-scale chemical leak were to occur in, say, for an American example, the Union Carbide Corp in Charleston, West Virginia, and having these chemicals leak into the nearby Kanawha River, traveling downstream for a possible infected deer with chronic wasting disease to wander over and drink from the river from either the Kanawha State Forest, Babcock State Park, or the Summit Bechtel Reserve, and it could lead to a series of events that led to infected people spreading throughout West Virginia. The outbreak could possibly start from a hunter that kills and eats an infected deer and spreading to their family, friends, and further in their little hometown. Or they could process this infected deer, send it out to customers or friends in a big city like Charleston, or maybe even large nearby cities like Cincinnati, Columbus, or Pittsburgh. Something different than freaking New York for once, Jesus Christ, for it to have a much more lethal ground zero. As with any pandemic threat level infection, all it takes is for it to spread in clusters of highly condensed population areas before it spins out of control. Overnight and into the next day, the infected swiftly took over a large portion of Seoul and spread out from there to places like Suwon, Daejeon, Daegu, and Gyeongsan, leaving only Busan as the only known safe haven that infected have not taken over in the span of 24 hours. Its hellish initial spread was predominantly due to the high homeless numbers in the streets and subways. So the more the population out and exposed to the infected outside near the start would cause an exponential infected rate. Also, if there might be a large concentration of people in said areas. The number of infected could rise up extremely fast with a majority of the healthy population just assuming people are just going insane during the onset and assume it's just mass rioting and hysteria, all while getting bitten or scratched in skirmishes, creating more of the infected. As we're seeing these days, it's hard to tell when people will take an outbreak seriously. Amongst those infected, their nearby friends and loved ones will most likely be completely oblivious to their new state of no mortal return. They don't really realize that they're zombies, and they will try to reason with them or act in a confused and startled manner, even if they knew what a zombie was, being in total disbelief, leading to their infection or demise. Even if they did fight back, all it takes is a mere scratch, and you will become one of the undead rioting and chaos would ensue, with many people being caught in the crossfire. Initial armed response would be to just quell ongoing riots, not expecting the nature of the newly created zombies. Tear gas and non-lethal force would be authorized very early on as well, but once the tear gas and beatings really don't work, and once elected officials and disease control centers caught wind of what this virus is doing, well, lethal force wouldn't be too far behind. The total unknown that is this virus, its transmission, its turn time, and not knowing who could be carrying the virus as a carrier could cause fear to spur further. And from afar, healthy and infected people can also blend in together amidst all of the chaos. Much like the sniper scene in 28 Weeks Later, this would all be cause for armed officials to shoot anyone on sight, and was the case as seen in Seoul Station with panicked masses in Seoul just wanting to get over the wall into safety and find refuge. But the police forces there were instructed to not let a single soul through, even the rich and poor. Nobody was allowed if they were in the areas that the infected were. So consider yourself one of those people. It doesn't matter what kind of person you are. If you're within those bounds, you are gonna die. The zombies' growing numbers and methods of hoarding would be effectively hard to combat, even with efficient weapons and fortifications. Considering the infected's relentless pursuit with no fear or triggers in their brain to hold back against deadly odds to preserve themselves, endlessly swarming at these police and SWAT teams until either the armed forces must reload and or fall back to reinforce themselves, or lest they be overwhelmed and killed depending on how early or late into the outbreak it is. A big draw of this South Korean sleeper was the fact that its characters and people had no firearms typical with any zombie genre fiction, leading to them resorting to some badass melee and direct combat. 
with only army soldiers and some police officials carrying guns and ammunition. So the ease of the zombie apocalypse consuming South Korea could be easier to understand. In countries like the United States, India, China, and Germany would have more people retaliating and defending themselves with some hot lead. But even then, each individual citizen can only do so much against the zombie horde as they plow through doors, break through windows, knock over defenses, and while their numbers may be shaved by free fire by these firearm carrying citizens, the zombies will continue to flow in through wherever you're defending through, and eventually you will be overwhelmed and all will be lost. Both the military and police forces in Train to Busan and Seoul Station had been wiped out easily and almost pathetically and it took falling back and fortifying a whole city not already experiencing the infection wholly to funnel in all people from this tiny train tunnel and shoot them on sight. Unless you're a little girl and pregnant woman who are singing Aloha Lo. As it usually goes for the why you wouldn't survive scenarios, it all depends on how quick containment of affected cities and areas are, how swift armed guards show up to quell the outbreak, and if it's even possible. The zombies' durability of surviving tons of damage their strength in holding on to their targets they pursue, their speed and stamina in giving chase, and their survivability to not expire unless straight out murdered can make for a long-winded and nearly impossible struggle. It's very possible that this zombie outbreak could be quelled, but the casualty rate would grow pretty damn large before that even happens. And a big number of us, including me, the guy that talks about you not surviving all the time, would be one of those faces amongst the tons of obituaries and names on those memorials. At the start of it all, unless you are heavily armed, suit yourself up correctly to protect yourself from any bites or scratches at any given time. Have a good enough place to hold out in for quite a while with plenty of rations to outlast undead zombies in case your country's government fails in fighting back. And the power of will to put down loved ones who were bitten considering the fast transmission rate, meaning you have to make these quick decisions to kill someone that's infected. But not only that, but once enough time has passed and anarchy sets in, you have to fight other people for survival and trying to keep these supplies, and other people just want to kill for the name of killing because a lot of people out there are insane. I have three questions for you, and I'll answer them with you. Do you have the mental fortitude? Do you have what it takes to take on a vicious feral zombie head on? Can you not cry like a little bitch when shit goes wrong as much as you cried watching the movie? For me, it's maybe, no, and hell no, I'm gonna cry like a little bitch. That's the end of the line for this particular look into the Train to Busan cinematic universe. Are you as hyped for the sequel as I am? Are you really discouraged by how Tokyo Drift it looks and how action-y it is compared to the last movie? Have you seen it already? How was it? Do not post any spoilers for it, by the way, but I'd still like to know if you liked it. If you like what you heard and saw in this video today, feel free to support just by liking and subbing and commenting to agree, disagree, or expand on small details I discussed. If you want to support a bit further, you can donate in a number of ways, like these fine wow folk from longtime supporters, Patreon patrons who get to see my videos days before they release, YouTube members who get exclusive emotes during my weekly Left 4 Dead live streams, and donating during my live streams themselves. I got merch as well on Teespring that you can check out. If you want to check out some more zombie content, I have a lot of Why You Wouldn't Survive videos on zombies, or you can check out my Zombie Sin series where I go over what's wrong with so many zombie movies and games out there that you can check out. Or if you want more content about Train to Busan, I do have videos discussing everything great and wrong about the movie, and even Sins discussing Soul Station. And above, you can see the discussion about chronic wasting disease becoming a zombie apocalypse that I brought up last year. So have a good weekend, and like I always say, don't forget to stay safe, stay healthy, keep that mask on while you're out in public, stay happy, and most importantly, please stay well. Wow.